Hello everyone, so welcome to the first of our video lectures on ethical theory. So in this video lecture we're going to be talking about the virtue ethics of Aristotle and we're going to be talking about Kantian ethics, which is the ethical theory um, that comes from the famous 18th century philosopher Immanuel Kant. Here's a sense of what we're going to accomplish um, in this video lecture. We're going to talk about what a moral theory is a little bit, because that kind of came up implicitly in a lot of your discussions in um, the week one and week two discussion boards, and there was some nice discussion there. Um, and then we're going to talk about Aristotle's theories, the main points in the theory, um, and then we're going to talk about Kant's ethics a little bit. Both of them very difficult to summarize uh, neatly, so there's a lot more to say. Um, but my aim here is to give you enough of a sense of what they thought, um, to give you some options um, to answer questions about what are the appropriate standards that we should be using in moral life and moral judgment? How can we get a systematic understanding of morality so that we can make consistent judgments and think through difficult problems in a consistent way that's not just gut feeling or that's not just kind of making it up as we go along. And that, to segue into our first point, is really uh, the point of moral theory. So a moral theory or a, an ethical theory is really an attempt to give a set of systematic, coherent answers to questions about morality. So it's an attempt to say what morality is, where it comes from, um, it's an attempt to say what are the appropriate criteria or standards for making judgments about moral permissibility, obligatoriness, and so on, um, and on what basis uh, we make these, um, and how to, as I said earlier, think our way through, to give a method and a system to understand moral life, what's important, and how to um, use our reason to give consistent answers to moral questions. Now that doesn't mean that giving answers to moral questions is easy just because you've adopted a particular moral theory, so now you have standards. For example, two different Kantian moral theorists might well disagree about what to do in a given situation, but at least they will be using much the same framework and the same criteria. And as we've been saying in the course so far, um, it's important to bear in mind that incorporating context is very important in making actual real-world moral decisions. So sure, you have your moral principles, you have what value, what principle, or moral rule is at stake, but what is it about that situation that's morally most relevant, and how could two instances um, of, let's say, um, being less than honest, how might they be different? And we explored a little bit of that in some of the earlier material that we have done. So, moral theory doesn't give us necessarily easy answers, but it tries to give us some kind of systematic set of tools and understanding so that we can give consistent answers to moral questions. So let's move ahead and talk a little bit about Aristotle. Aristotle is one of the most famous ancient Greek philosophers, and I know a lot of beginning students in, who are new to philosophy might be surprised that we in the 21st century are still talking about uh, somebody from thousands of years ago. And the answer is that um, in philosophy, we still talk about some of these ancient ideas because they're still relevant. They have insights that are durable and um, that still give us food for thought um, all these years on. So philosophers tend to be constantly in dialogue with thinkers of the past, perhaps more so than um, many other disciplines. So we'll see what you think. Does Aristotle, in your view, have some good insights about what it is to live well? One thing to note about any moral theory is that it tries to give you a sense, first of all, of what's the appropriate or most important moral question that we need to be asking. And virtue ethics, and Aristotle is just one example of virtue ethics, but he's the most famous, so we're going to talk about him. Aristotle's virtue ethics, their guiding question is how to live well. So what is the good life? 
Notice how broad that is. It's not so much about let's narrow down criteria for one specific action to say if it's permissible or not. Rather, the tendency is to say we've got to put this in the context of what it is to have a good life overall. So it's a broad theory um, that wants us to think about how we are living in, a, in the big picture. In many ways, that's quite an attractive way of thinking, and I think um, we can all profit from, profit metaphorically, of course, from the exercise of just asking that question. What is it for me to live a good life? And what goes along with that is, what kind of person do I need to be to live this good life? And that's what's virtue ethics. So what kind of virtues, what kind of quality of character uh, do I need to cultivate in myself to live this good life? So it's a question of what kind of life are you living? What kind of person are you being? Um, and notice what's interesting as well is that this kind of moral theory is a lot about sort of me deciding, well, am I living the good life when I'm doing this? Um, and somewhat secondarily, it's about, well, what about the person whose life I'm impacting by doing X, Y, or Z? There are ups and downs to that approach, but I think it's definitely a really, really interesting set of questions. So for our purposes, and I want you to be thinking about this and discussing this a lot in the discussion forum, is how can we um, use some of these ideas to think through some of the moral conundrums that arise in our professional lives. So what would it mean to ask in the context of your future career, and perhaps you'd like to think of yourself in where you're gonna be in five years time or 10 years time, what kinds of problems are you gonna be coming up against morally? And in that context, you know, what does it mean for you to live a good life and be a good person? in that particular context. And you can ask of any particular action, well, you know, is, is this fitting well with what it is to live a good life? Is, is doing this kind of thing, is that me being the best kind of person I can be and living the best kind of life that I can live? And of course, best life or good life here is, you know, morally good life as well as everything else. Okay, so that's the key question. How does Aristotle go about answering it? Well, the first thing he starts off with is this claim that every action has an end or an aim. One thing to notice here is that Aristotle is a very functionalist thinker. So things are good to the extent that they fulfill their function, and Aristotle thinks that's tremendously important. So every action has an end or an aim. An end, you know, in this sense means an aim, right? Thing, reason for the sake of which something is done. And a thing is good to the extent to which it fulfills this end or aim or purpose or its distinctive work. Okay, so a good knife cuts well because cutting is the end or aim of proper end or aim of a knife. A good phone does all the myriad things that phones um, do and it does them well. Uh, a good camera takes pictures well. Um, and so on and so forth. So that's okay when it comes to particular objects. Aristotle's next move is to say that human life as a whole, right, you can look at human life as a kind of thing um, and ask, well, if there is a distinctive um, function or end or aim or purpose for knives or cameras or even body parts like the eye whose function is just to see, Likewise, shouldn't there logically be uh, a particular function or end or aim for human life as a whole? And this is where Aristotle um, makes a very distinctive move. And Aristotle says, yes, there has to be. Human life has to have some distinctive work, some distinctive end or aim or purpose. So if we can figure out what that is, then we'll kind of know what it is to lead a good life. Now, the key thing here is that um, something's end or aim means its distinctive work, right? That thing that it does or aims for um, that nothing else quite does and that m without it doing that, it wouldn't be the thing that it is. So it has to be something distinctive to it. So Aristotle goes through some possibilities and, and says, for example, um, things like just eating, you know, nutrition and those kind of bodily functions, that's not the distinctive end or aim of human life, because we share that function 
with um, plants and animals. Likewise, kind of basic emotional reactions and desires, we share those with animals, um, like dogs and cats and horses and so on. So that can't be our distinctive work, our distinctive function. Instead, Aristotle comes up with what, for a philosopher, is a pretty unsurprising answer, namely that reasoning, right, rational activity, using our reason, using um, our minds to think through and contemplate things, that is something that sets us apart. So that's the distinctive work or the distinctive function of human life. So this, he's, he, he thinks, is the key, right? This is the, the good life. This is the, the particular distinctive function or work of human life. And he calls it eudaimonia. Sometimes it's translated as happiness. It's not a great translation um, because happiness has, in English, has some connotations that Aristotle wouldn't really uh, go for. Um, I think a better translation is flourishing or doing well. Um, literally, the, the, the Greek word kind of translates as something like being governed, but your life being governed by a good spirit. So Aristotle explains that eudaimonia is rational activity of the soul, and by soul he means something like we would call mind um, in accordance with virtue. So you do this distinctive thing, right, reasoning, and you do it well, you do it in accordance with virtue. So the good life, the thing that we're aiming for is rational activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. Next, <clears throat> it might seem sort of obscure how that would help us figure out how to do the right thing. And here, Aristotle, at this point in the argument, Aristotle begins making more of that connection. So let's think about that a little bit. So Aristotle at this point begins talking a lot about virtue. So we talk rational activity of the soul in accordance with virtue, right, is what we should be aiming for. But what, what is this virtue thing? And Aristotle says, well, it's a fixed disposition where you um, tend to do the right thing and you like doing the right thing. So one really important question is, well, how do we get to be this kind of person and live this kind of life? And Aristotle says some very interesting things about that that I think are very relevant to life in general and our professional lives in particular. And one thing Aristotle says that's important is habituation. So we have to learn from an early age, we have to be molded through habit to learn to take pleasure in doing the right thing. And Aristotle is pretty pessimistic about the moral prospects of somebody who doesn't have this training. So we learn to take pleasure in doing the right thing just by going through the motions first, by getting practice in the habit of doing the right thing, you know, and then we begin to take pleasure in doing that, and then that makes us want to do the right thing more. So we, we, we do more and more virtuous things. Now at this point we're like, well, what's, what's the right thing? What, what is a virtuous act or a virtuous thing to do? And Aristotle gives us this, this rather uh, curious answer. He said, well, it's, it's whatever the virtuous person would do. Now take a moment and consider what might be the problem with that. So what's a virtuous act? Well, it's what the virtuous person would do. Where's the problem there? Hopefully in that moment you will have been thinking, well, isn't that a little bit of a circle? Well, what would the virtuous person do? How can you tell, um, you know, who are these virtuous people? Um, and what basis do we make that distinction? And at a practical level, of course, you know, moral exemplars are really, really useful and important. Um, it's great to be able to point to somebody and say, wow, you know, I wish I could be as kind or have as much integrity as that person. However, it just seems like from what Aristotle says that we, we, we're left with no criteria to make that judgment of, well, who is that person with integrity? Um, there's no perfect answer to that question. Aristotle seems to think that, well, we, we know it when we see it. Um, what do you think? Do you think we know it when we see it, when we see a person who acts with virtue, who lives well, who's courageous or has integrity, etc.? Sometimes it's clearer than at other points.
Now, how else do we try and kind of put this into practice and actually arrive at a situation where we, where we are um, being virtuous and flourishing and moving towards this eudaimonia? And here Aristotle gives us another really famous idea, and it's called a theory of the mean. Now, the idea here isn't that Aristotle is giving you any kind of um, rule book that you can just apply without thinking to any given situation. It's more of a framework for you have to having still to do the work of figuring out what counts as the right thing to do in any situation. No moral theory, by the way, is really going to give you that. You're still going to have to take the criteria that are set out in the theory and the framework that's set out in the theory and apply it to the particular context you're in and reason through how that would play out in your given situation. And Aristotle's theory is just the same in that respect. So he gives you this theory of the mean just to, to act as a frame for your decision making. You still have to make the decisions, but you do have this framework. And the idea is this. Aristotle thinks that every virtue, such as courage in the example we have here, is defined by its relationship between its deficiency, right, having too little of it, like cowardice is too little courage, and on the other hand, excess, right, having too much of the given thing, and foolhardiness or rashness would be too much courage. So in every, any given situation when we're deciding what to do, if we, let's say, want to be courageous in a given situation, Aristotle is saying to us, in that situation, it's useful to try and imagine, well, what would a deficiency of courage, what would cowardice look like in this particular situation? And you can figure that out and sort of look at it and have it to think about, okay, I won't do that. And then on the other hand, try and figure out or imagine what would an excess of courage look like in this particular situation? So what would be foolhardy to do in this situation? And you imagine that and you picture it and you have, okay, and now you'll have a picture of this, this other thing that I need to avoid. And of course the mean, which is not of course the arithmetic mean, um, but is like the, the optimum point, is going to be to steer a course in between those two things. Right? So you're going to be steering a middle course in between too little, right, the deficiency, cowardice, and too much, excess, right, foolhardiness. So how could you avoid both cowardice and foolhardiness in this situation? And note, in this situation. So for example, um, if you are in a situation where you may be um, wondering whether you should break up a fight, well, it matters a lot in terms of asking what would be foolhardy to do, for example, whether the fight is between two three-year-olds and you're an adult, um, or, you know, whether it's between two very, very large, strong people with weapons. Uh, it also matters who you are, right? Um, are you faced with a lot of physical challenges that make it difficult for you to, um, to pull people apart? Or are you um, someone who's had long years of training in martial arts, right? So those, things, th those pieces of the context are going to be incredibly important in determining what cowardice would look like in this situation and what foolhardiness would look like in this situation. Um, and it's a neat exercise, maybe in the discussion you can do this, um, to maybe work through some examples. And it's always really, really good when you can look at some examples from business. Um, and in particular, it's really uh, kind of neat if you can uh, look through or, or think through some examples from your own line of work or your own line of work that you'd like to go into in the future. And I think we can get some rich discussion uh, from that. So try and figure out what, what the theory of the mean look like in uh, a business kind of situation. We can think of some examples. And of course, we can do the same thing for all kinds of other virtues like friendliness, what's the deficiency and excess of that, um, generosity, uh, loyalty, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's a good one to uh, to, to, to get into some discussion about examples with. So, as we've said, hitting the mean, um, that's the phraseology that Aristotle used. So getting things right, uh, context is important, and two other things are important as well. Number one, Aristotle says, you've got to be aware that we're all going to have a bias toward what is pleasant for us, right? So we're all going to kind of tend toward that option 
that is uh, least unpleasant for us. That's kind of just a natural bias we have, most of us have. Um, and then finally, we also need to be aware of our own particular failings. So if you know that you know, your particular kind of problem or weakness is that you tend to be like too friendly, right? Um, well, then you might need to correct course and be a little bit more cautious or reticent about, you know, maybe being intrusive to others. Watch out for, well, am I being friendly here or am I kind of invading someone's space a little bit? Maybe I need to kind of err on the side of pulling back um, from certain, interacting in certain ways. Whereas somebody who is much more of an introvert um, and tends toward kind of not being friendly enough might need to put themselves forward a little bit more and go, okay, well, maybe I need to, to be friendly to hit that mean of friendliness. Maybe I need to actually be a little bit more stepping forward than I usually am. So I, I think that's actually very, very good advice. Again, maybe you can think of some examples of this. Aristotle um, also thinks virtue and vice are in our power. Of course, subject to the proviso that we've had some habituation, right, practice at developing the virtues. Now, of course, a really good question is what's in our power? So what's voluntary, right? And one important question here that's really relevant for business ethics contexts is questions of ignorant wrongdoing. What should you know? And ignorance can be of two kinds. Um, you can have somebody not knowing a material fact um, and they're not knowing it results in them harming somebody, let's say. So for example, um, let's say I don't know, I, I'm, I'm ignorant of the fact that my friend whom I'm inviting over for dinner has a very unusual allergy. And without having any idea, um, I make a dinner with, that has this um, allergen in it. Um, and then do, you know, my friend has an allergic reaction and I cause harm. Um, that's ignorance of, I think, bl blameless ignorance because it's a very unusual allergen and nobody told me. Um, that's ignorance of a material fact that was relevant to me causing harm. So in that sense, you know, my action in causing that harm isn't uh, culpable, it isn't blameworthy. Um, now, sometimes there are situations where we would expect people to know certain things. And of course, in, in business ethics, right, that's a really, really, really important thing. And I'm sure we can think of quite a few kind of corporate scandals and so on that a lot of it turns on um, what did high level executives in that organization know? What should they have known? For example, about the harm done by certain products, right? Um, so let's say your company sells an unhealthy or otherwise harmful product. Um, to what extent should you know? Um, and to what extent um, are you um, off the hook of responsibility for not knowing at that, uh, that's something that the product was harmful. And there can be lots of layers of this, right? Sometimes, and we know this very well in everyday life, um, we can kind of know but not really want to know and shield ourselves from knowing things that kind of at some level we really do know. Um, and the philosopher Michelle Moody Adams actually has a great paper on this where she talks about um, the concept of affected ignorance. She says, not knowing what we can and should know because we have layers, right? So we kind of ignore or rationalize or kind of pretend and so on. That can be a really, really, really important and significant phenomenon in a lot of um, corporate scandals and so on. Now, there's another kind of ignorance, um, moral ignorance. So not knowing that something was wrong. And that's also really interesting as well. Oh, I didn't know it was wrong to do X, Y, or Z. And sometimes in complex cases um, that can be uh, quite relevant, right? Um, broad issue, um, um, perhaps we can talk about this in the discussion board. Um, sometimes we can be blameworthy for our ignorance. So maybe you weren't careful enough to investigate something. Maybe you failed to learn something. Maybe you failed to listen. Or maybe some of Aris, one of Aristotle's examples, um, you know, she, Aristotle takes the example of somebody who, um, let's say, gets, gets drunk and then does some silly stuff 
uh, that they would have known better to do if they um, hadn't been drinking. And Aristotle thinks, well, you're at fault for putting yourself in that situation and drinking. Um, so there's lots of complex ways in which ignorance can be morally questionable. But there are lots of instances as well where us not knowing something um, might be blameless as well. So I think there's lots of food for thought um, in there for business ethics contexts. <coughs> Next, let's take a, a little look at Kantian ethics. Kant's ethics, so Kant, Immanuel Kant was an 18th century um, philosopher from what is now, um, from what was then um, part of the future of Germany. So Kant was a German speaking um, philosopher in the 18th century. Very famous, very influential. His moral theory is really complicated. So inevitably here we're just giving you some of the highlights and some of the tools that might be useful in um, framing business ethics questions. So inevitably, as they say here, it, it will be a little bit simplified. Notice that in Aristotle, we had the starting question of how can I live the best kind of life? How can I be the best kind of person that I could be? Kant's question is, the central question, is really different. Kantian ethics um, is all about me, the moral agent, uh, deciding what I ought to do in a given situation, number one. And that's something that's actually often misunderstood about Kant. Um, it's actually not primarily a theory designed for pointing fingers morally at other people and saying, oh, that person is blameworthy. And the reason is that Kant thinks it's incredibly, incredibly difficult to know um, how blameworthy someone else is because you, it's very difficult to know other people's reasons for acting. It's even difficult sometimes to know our own reasons for acting. And this is important because the reasons why you're acting, so one's reasons for acting are the principles upon which one is acting when one does something, that's the key to what gets morally assessed in Kant's theory. So some um, explanations of Kant's theory put it in, in the following way that you're judging people's intentions. Um, Kant scholars don't really like using that language of intentions, but for our purposes, um, we can simplify a little bit and, and say that something like that is going on. That um, what matters is, well, what do I take myself to be doing? What am I trying to do? What principle am I acting according to when I do this thing? And really, this captures the insight that sometimes just the world doesn't turn out how we expect it. And sometimes you can be acting according to some plan or principle and things just unbeknownst to you just don't turn out uh, the way you expected. Um, and Kantians will tend to think, you know, you can't be held blameworthy um, for those totally unexpected ways in which, you know, your actions can turn out to have really dif different consequences. Um, what really matters is, well, what was your reason for acting? What were you trying to do? What was in your will? And that's why we have this uh, phrase here at the beginning, the good will. What matters for Kantian ethics is what's in your will? Do you, is your will good um, or is it not good? Right, so what's, what are you wanting to do? What are you, to, to put it roughly, what are you intending um, to do? Because two people can do the exact same action, but we might look at them very differently because one was doing it in order to look good and the other was doing it actually because they thought it was the right thing to do. So, for example, uh, two people um, deciding to help somebody um, who's in need, one person might do it just because they want to look good in front of other people. And we might kind of have a little bit of a different moral opinion of that than of somebody who saw somebody in need and thought, well, it's only right that I should help. Um, so I need to go ahead and help that person. Okay, so. With this in mind, we have this distinction in Kant between acting from duty and acting merely in accordance with duty. And by duty here, Kant means moral duty. Kant does not mean your duty in your job 
or um, your legal duty or anything like that because all of those things can conflict with one another, right? Your job description might ask you to go against your moral duty and Kant says your moral duty has to come first. So acting from duty just means doing the right thing, doing your moral duty because it's the right thing to do. Acting merely in accordance with duty means you do that action that is right to do, but you do it for some other reason, like you want to look good or that kind of thing. And Kant's basic take is that that matters. Okay, so point one, what's really important is you know why you're doing what it is that you're doing. That makes a real difference to the moral status of, um, of your action. Okay. The second is that Kant talks about the form that genuinely moral commands must take. And by commands, he doesn't mean somebody else tells you what to do, right? Because that's not morality in his view. Um, morality is all about the commands that I give myself because I recognize that something genuinely is the right thing to do. And what's important here is that Kant says that um, genuinely moral commands or laws um, as he puts it, must be categorical, not, not hypothetical. And there's a longer story to be told, but for our purposes, the key point that I want to get across is that it can't be conditional. So, for example, um, the example we had in the text, a hypothetical imperative, right, imperative meaning command, a hypothetical imperative would be, um, be nice to the kids in the playground if you want them to be friendly to you. Now, the problem with that as a moral uh, form of command is that it depends upon you wanting to be friendly with the other kids in the playground. If you don't, then that kind of rule or moral command loses all kind of force. And Kant says, that can't be. We can't let you off the hook. If something is right, it's right no matter what ends or aims or purposes you have. Um, so it must be just like, well, you should be um, nice to the kids in the playground because that's the right thing to do. So that's just the form, though, so what they must look like. Um, what we really want to know is what's the content of genuine moral commands or laws? What kind of genuine moral criteria does Kant gives us to make real-world genuine moral decisions? And that's where we get this formula of humanity. Now, here I'm really simplifying because in Kant's writing, he gives you um, several different versions or formulations, he calls them, of this basic kind of moral rule he, that he calls the categorical imperative. And it would take a very long time and just a lot of complex argumentation to really explain the relationship among all of these formulations. Um, but the formula of humanity is probably the best known one, and it's probably the one that's most amenable to application um, in the kinds of contexts we're going to be talking about. Because we want to know, for our purposes, what kind of criterion for deciding what we ought to do um, is this theory giving us? Right? How can we use this to determine what in our professional lives uh, we ought to do so that we can do the right thing? And this comes closest to doing that. So here's Kant's kind of basic um, master rule, if you like, uh, or master criterion that we need to consider when we're thinking of doing something. This is kind of the test that it has to pass, if you want to put it that way. So it runs, treat humanity, whether in your own person or that of another, never as a mere means, but always as an end in itself. Four points um, to note there. So whether in your own person or that of another means you have moral duties to yourself as well as to others. Kant thought that moral duty really arose out of our nature as reasoning beings. And we, each of us, is just as much of a person as everybody else. So it follows that whatever we morally owe other people, we owe the same duties of respect and so on to ourselves as we do to others. And that can be have some pretty important moral consequences. So you cannot act in ways uh, that undermine yourself. So that's one important point. Second important point is that this key idea that you respect personhood. And for Kant, 
like quite a few philosophers, our personhood is innately kind of bound up with reason and autonomy. And when Kant talks about autonomy, he doesn't just mean being in charge of your life, he means primarily moral autonomy. The capacity to really, as he puts it, give law to yourself. The capacity to um, have moral responsibility, basically. And that's, a, that's something that we have because we're, um, we're rational. We're, we're beings that have reason. We understand consistency, right? Because that's a, a big, big uh, feature of rationality is the idea of consistency. And part of consistency is just treating, um, treating people consistently and, and fairly and having a level playing field. There's a complex relationship among all of those things. Um, so I can only give um, a very um, short explanation. Um, but respecting personhood Right, my own personhood and respecting every other person and respecting their autonomy and respecting their reason and respecting their capacity uh, to live their lives and be morally responsible beings. That's absolutely key um, to Kant's theory. And, you know, if, ever, if you ever um, see the phrase in an applied ethics article, respect for persons, that's a key that that person is using a Kantian framework. Right. Um, okay, so coming out of that, right, we have this um, idea of never using anyone as a mere means. So what does that mean? Well, basically, it's the everyday insight that it's wrong to use people. Okay, so obviously, we use people as means to our ends a lot, right? So in really, really innocuous ways, Right, so I, I ask somebody for directions. Yeah, they are helping me toward my aim or end of getting where I need to go. Sure, that's no problem. What is a problem is if I view that person only as a tool um, or a, a thing for me to use for my ends, if I don't acknowledge that, well, they have this whole significance and value apart from my needs or wants. One thing that comes out of this is that, you know, if you can't use people, it means you can't deceive them, you can't coerce them, you can't manipulate them. You have to respect their personhood and their autonomy and their ability to make decisions, live their lives, etc. So there's a reason why deception and coercion are particularly um, bad no-nos in Kantian moral theory. So you can't use somebody as a mere means, you can't treat them merely as though they were a thing or a tool as a, or an object for you to use or for you to treat however you want in pursuing your own objectives. Finally, and it's an underappreciated facet of Kant's theory, you, always, you also have to treat them always as an end in itself. Now, what that means is not only do you have to avoid using them, right, so deceiving or coercing them or treating them as things, but you also have to support their personhood. So that means that you do have a moral obligation to help and support others, at least sometimes, in pursuing their morally permissible ends, right? So as humans, we're the kinds of rational beings who have needs. We can't do it all alone. We often are in a position where we need help uh, from others uh, to live our lives the way we want to. We need help from other people every day. So Kant's idea is that, well, really respecting others' personhood also means that they sometimes need our support. Not everyone and all the time, because that would be literally impossible, but you sometimes have to, at least sometimes, have to help support and help others so that they can um, really live, um, live their lives and so that you can really treat them as full people, as full persons. How that might play out in a business context, what does it mean to respect persons, what does it mean to respect their autonomy, what does it mean not to treat others as, as things, as mere tools um, for your ends, well, I think that can lead to some rich discussions, which I look forward to hearing more about in the discussion board.